The I More Show is brought to you today by TransferWise, the smart new way to send money abroad. If you've moved money across international borders, you know it is annoying, it is expensive. Banks and other providers charge hidden fees, often by making up the exchange rate they give you. TransferWise is different. There's a small percent fee on each transfer, and they give you real market exchange rate, the one you'll see on Google or Bloomberg. That's why TransferWise is up to eight times cheaper than sending money abroad with your bank. TransferWise is trustworthy too. People like you in more than 50 countries send more than $5 billion overseas. Ready to try it? Head over to transferwise.com slash iMore and your first transfer up to $500 will be free. Thank you, TransferWise. It is December 17th, 2015, Star Wars Day, but we da, alas have... Da, 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 da. All right. But we alas have Apple stuff to talk about. This is the iMore Show. Bum, we can bum, talk about Apple and Star bum, Wars. Bum, we can make it happen. Everything is going according to my design. Here, we can we can start it off with two Apple Star Wars news bits before we move on. All right, awesome. One, do it. one. If you have Apple Music, um, even if it's a free subscription, I believe, there is a John Williams Apple Music channel on Apple Music. And it is glorious. And it just plays nothing but soundtracks from the various movies uh, interspersed with little tiny sound clips from the film. So you might hear like a chewy go, or you might hear a droid beep, or you might hear a blaster noise. It's it's delightful. Um, I apologize to every, no, I don't. I don't apologize to everybody who's like, why won't you shut up about Star Wars? Because you know what? I am an unabashed Star Wars nerd. Renee is an unabashed Star Wars nerd. You come to iMore, I, I think for the Apple News, but also for us. So, uh, so we're going to talk about Star Wars a little bit with our with our Apple News. Yeah, and faith I'm in sorry. your friends is yes. <laughs> uh, Renee may just talk like the Emperor <laughs> the entire time and just quote people. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna let's talk about uh, let's talk about the new Apple News before we talk about our finish up our year in review or continue our year in review. Uh, there's so much. To, so we woke up this morning and Apple put out a press release and um, it's new information for the public. This Apple's been under going uh, a very subtle internal reorganization for months. And it's just, it's not something that was public because there was a lot of pieces that needed to be moved around. And they got to the point today, and I don't know if they were waiting on the Jeff Williams bit to just, because I mean, Jeff Williams went from senior vice president to chief operating officer. And officers are really important from like a finance and Wall Street and everything point of view. It's an officer of the company. They are. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Jeff Williams now, he was, uh, let's talk about Jeff Williams first. So he was uh, vice president of operations when Tim Cook was chief operating officer under Steve Jobs. Tim Cook became chief executive officer. Jeff Williams became senior vice president of operations. But Tim Cook has always been an ops guy, Ren. That's just that's just where he lives. He's not a product guy the way Steve Jobs was. So there was some talk about whether he needed a COO the way that Steve Jobs did. Yeah, um, for sure. I mean, I think what's, uh, what's really... Not sort of a no brainer is that uh, Williams has basically been Tim Cook's number two on the operations side for years. And I feel like this is just an official SEC recognition of all of the work that he's doing. Um, and yeah, I, I think that it's probably time also. Tim Cook has a little a little few more things to do other than watch over the operations side at this point. Yeah, and, and you know, Tim Cook is world class when it comes to operations. He he is arguably best in the world. You can make an argument now, Jeff Williams is best in the world because Tim Cook has other things to do, but it's it's super interesting because Tim Cook was widely not was not that much was not well recognized at first his contributions like that famous saying i think from john gruber where how can apple make an ipad because of steve jobs how can they make it for five hundred dollars because of tim cook and his value became more apparent but because he was in charge of ops jeff williams's role was always even like one step more shadowed i think yeah i mean we've seen him actually kind of come out of the shadows recently with uh with research kit and a couple of other things but, he ran the watch yeah he did ran the watch um but but yes, he's very much an operations guy. And by nature, that kind of means the operations guys not exactly skulk. Skulk is the wrong word. They just they take care of things. They do the they do the work that the uh that the CEO can't really take care of right now. They're the, they're the fix it guys. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, according to like Wall Street, the CEO raises money and manages shareholders, and the COO just like makes sure everything runs. Apple doesn't work that way; never has worked that way. But there is still huge, massive supply chains, um, and and products to ship and thing. And yeah, we we have talked previously about how like it's still hard to find an Apple pencil. It was hard to get you know a steel watch for a long time. But Apple is shipping more products than ever before, and more variations of products than ever before, and that's an incredibly difficult job. 
Mm -hmm. No question. Um, I mean, yeah, just like you were saying, we've got a lot of things now. We've got an iPad. We've got several different kinds of iPads, several different kinds of iPhones, Macs, battery watches, cases, battery cases, pencils, which are still in short supply. Maybe the promotion to COO is like, hey, Jeff Williams, fix this. We'll give you a promotion, but uh, get people pencils. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's a recognition because Apple in many ways is still a tiny company. It's still a, a giant company composed of tiny startups. Yes. That, but they have to act like a big Wall Street company and they have to have yeah. like the CEO. And now they've got four. They've got the chief executive officer, the chief financial officer, Luca Maestri, the chief design officer, Johnny Ive, and now the chief operating officer, Jeff Williams. And yeah, he's doing watch the way, you know, Scott Forrestal used to do iOS before that was folded in because it's a new product and you have to have, you have to have some... And this is, we'll get to this later in the App Store thing, but unless someone wakes up in the morning and their only job is to make a new product amazing, that product will never be amazing. So you have to have someone run it. But over time, I think this clarifies if there was any doubt about who was doing operations at Apple, whether Tim Cook, how involved he still was, and how much Jeff Williams was, I think this clears it up. And it sort of, in a weird way, frees them both to yes. focus on what's next for Apple. Absolutely. I would agree with you there. So the, the other big news is Phil Schiller is officially taking over the App Store. And the App Store is a really weird creature inside Apple because it it overlays several different organizations. Even if we discount Craig Federici's organization that actually builds the frameworks uh, and a lot of the software that developers use to make apps, you still have Eddie Q's org, which runs iTunes, which is what the App Store runs on. That, that means the servers and all this, the software that runs on those servers, the CMS that runs uh, iTunes, iTunes Connect, all those things, uh, supremely important. But he also did App Store management and business development and App Store editorial. So everything you see up when you go to an app on an app page, that's all um, Eddie Q's organization. But at the same time, traditionally, Phil Schiller ran developer relations and he ran uh, evangelism, which was getting people, to, which, which is directly interfacing with developers. And he runs famously or infamously App Review. And you, you had these problems because they were two separate organizations organizations. Behind the scenes, I, I think Phil was unofficially the head of App Store the entire time, but now it literally is his name on it. Everyone knows the buck stops with Phil. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really kind of hoping that this is also a, as you said, a move towards more uh, a recognition to the developer community that, hey, we recognize that are, there's some problems with the App Store. And Phil Schiller, you know, Phil Schiller gets stuff done. Um, he hasn't he hasn't been around Apple this long um, just because he's a pretty face. He he knows how to he knows how to fix things. He's very well attuned with the developer community. He knows what's going on. I'm I'm kind of hoping that this is a sign of the times, saying yes, the app stores are a priority for us, and we're gonna go in deep on it. We're gonna we're gonna make it work. I'm cautiously optimistic because there's been significant pain points on both sides. Like on Eddie Q's side, um, a lot of people just don't think he gives enough resources to it. And the App Store is built is a multi-billion dollar business. It is arguably as important to Apple as any of their their like the iPod, probably more important than the iPod right now, arguably as important as the Mac, maybe as the iPod as the iPad, yet it, it didn't have someone whose only job it was to wake up in the morning and make it an awesome product. And you, you people would say there's not enough resources. We, we just can't get enough servers. We can't get enough uh, engineers. Uh, the Mac App Store, all the engineers we can get, they're working on iOS, they're not working on the Mac App Store. And I don't know if Schiller solves this. And conversely, all the, the problems that people have been complaining about, about App Review, that's all been under Schiller's watch already. When people say like the App Store is capricious and non-responsive, that's under Schiller. He, he's already in charge of that. So is, is him having his name more officially on the door, does that give impetus to maybe get it fixed better? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm hoping so. I I, I mean, you can't say for sure. It, it could just it could just be in name only. It could just be like, oh yeah, we're really paying attention to the app store. But I do I do think that Apple is aware of the issues and keyed into it. I still so we, we have this huge disconnect. Like a lot of us have, we have really good friends who are indie developers and we feel their pain, but at the same time, the way Apple looks at indie developers and their importance isn't always the same thing. I, in my world, indie developers would, would just like, would there be high priced apps and they'd all make fantastic livings writing all the software I ever want them to write. But at the same, you know, but Apple's bills right now are being paid by the candy crushes and electronic arts. And there's a huge disconnect there. And when Apple says, like when they say Apple doesn't care, they might just not care about you. And that that might be a bad thing, but it also might be a thing that you can change by pointing out how important it is. Like, like in a way, and it sounds weird to say this, you got to sell this to Apple. You got to sell to them how important the Mac App Store is and why and why it deserves resources over something else. And I wonder if with Schiller in charge and a single person in charge, we we sort of have we know who to lobby now. 
Yeah. I mean, that it is really nice that there's a face now on the App Store. And the fact that Schiller is, um, I won't say he's the most accessible Apple executive in the world, but he is certainly more accessible than other Apple executives. He replies to things on his Twitter. He goes on John Gruber's uh, talk show. You know, he, he re replies to people who reach out to him, which is really, really awesome. So I'm hoping that that's, that's one avenue. Uh, but to your point about, you know, maybe Apple cares less about indie developers as they do about the people who really make them the money. Some of the big pain points for the app store, like clones, um, are still, uh, those are important for big developers as much as they are for little developers. They just eat into a little developer salary much more. You know, the fact that 2048 overcame threes, of course, which is a popular indie game, um, tile matching game. And like that, that's a big deal. The fact that there are clones of Candy Crush, there are clones of Flappy Bird, there are, you know, there are bad apps floating around because the app store is so big. Facebook tries to clone Snapchat. I mean, it happens <laughs> at all levels. Exactly. So I, I do think that um, addressing those issues are going to help all of its bottom line. And the, I mean, to be honest, the more Apple treats its developers on all scales as these, you know, we are committed to you guys. And it doesn't matter that there are millions of people who want to develop for our platforms because we want to make sure it's a good experience so that people continue to want to develop for our platform. I think that is their, their has to be their goal because the, the worst that the app store experience gets, the worse people are going to feel about it. It's going to be more frustrating. Yeah. And I don't mean to imply that they don't care. Like I, I think people inside Apple care desperately. A lot of them were indie developers. Um, they know all those pains. It's just they are dealing, and no one believes it when we say this, but they are dealing with limited resources. There's fierce competition from other tech companies like Facebook and Google, from startups where people think they can make a lot of money more quickly. And not everyone wants to live in Cupertino, quite frankly. Uh, and that's a requirement for working on a lot of this stuff. And when they have these resources, they're like, I don't have enough. I have to put it where we're making the most value and the most money. And to get them to change that, to get them to think that it's it's incredibly important and they, they have to fix it, you got to tell them why and why it aligns with their business and their interests. And you got to find the best way to do that. And sometimes that's just one. That's why I love it when people complain, because sometimes it's just that one article, like, you know, Phil Schiller or somebody will pick up that article and that article will state the case better than anybody has stated it before. And they'll have sort of like an aha moment mm -hmm. and radical change will follow. Uh, and it could be it could be Serenity's article. It could be, you know, uh, Craig. Um, Sorry, uh, I'm blanking on... Um, Craig Federighi? Burp, no, Hockenberry. It could be Hockenberry's oh, article. Oh, Hockenberry writing an yeah. article. It could be Marco. It could be anybody, but it, it yeah. just it got, it crystallizes the problem in the way... It's almost like a radar, where like the first few radars, they understood it was a problem, but they couldn't see what it was, and then suddenly one comes across that lets them reproduce it exactly and fix it. And it was just, it wasn't that they didn't care. It's just, they didn't know how to fix it. And that, that, you know, it helped them understand. Mm -hmm. So I hope people keep complaining to me though. I, I still want that dedicated, like right now, if everything goes under Schiller's org and it's sort of unclear because right now, a lot of people on the app store team actually work like off in a different area of Apple, like a different campus in the iTunes section. And do those move to Schiller? Do they, do they physically move? Do the reporting chains move? Uh, and I don't even know if all of them know that this is happening right now. So we'll have to wait and see. But I, I would still like there to be a vice president of App Store underneath Phil Schiller, whose, again, only job it is to wake up in the morning and make the App Store terrific, to to read those articles, to care about that, to be a dub dub as a, as a focal point. Because Phil Schiller, like Eddie Q, is only one person. And the portfolio of an executive vice president, at, a senior vice president at Apple, it, it is... It, unimaginably hard. Like if you look at all the responsibilities they have, and I'm glad they hired, I'm blanking on the name, but they hired a new uh, vice president of marketing communications. That's great. Apparently Greg Joswack is doing more on the product side. That's great. Uh, Cause you need, you need a team. Uh, yeah. One individual cannot do all this. So I'm just hoping there is a get like the way there's a VP of product, a VP of um, Mark Homs, a VP of app store to me would be an ideal at this point. Yeah, I agree. I mean, is it Phil? Phil is just one guy, as you pointed out, um, and he does have a lot of other jobs. Uh, it's not just like he's throwing away everything else, being like, "Okay, time to focus on App Store." I imagine that there is a VP, or there's soon to be a VP of App Store. There is a director of App Store yes. in the iTunes organization, but it's very different than what I think a VP would do. Yes, I imagine that um, probably one of their first priorities will be to get somebody to focus on revamping the App Store. It is getting long in the tooth. It's still an HTML5 web view. You know, there there are some things here that can definitely be overhauled. Um, whether or not that means overhauling it in a way that indie developers will love or not, but um, but. There's, there are options here. There are, there are potentials.
Yeah, and it's the and I think you know, as much as I think this is supremely important, like still the day to day stuff is a bit confusing to me. Like if if you work on the app store and it's your job to actually manage what shows up on the app store, you're still managing that inside iTunes. So like you re- maybe you report to Phil Schiller, but if something's not working or you need something different, that's still an iTunes thing. That's still under Eddie. So I mean, it, it's it's not uh, like it, it is still a, a a organization. Sorry, it is still a job that spans organizations, and that is always tough because you have competing interests. Like maybe the guy who's actually in charge of programming the CMS is working on something for iTunes movies and just can't get to you, and but you need it. You know, it's it's it, it's it's not going to be simple for a while. I think. Yeah, I agree. All right. So the other one, this one warms my heart. And so Johnny Saruji is the other Johnny. Like Johnny, when you say Johnny at Apple, you immediately think of Johnny. Johnny, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So the same way like Williams was a little bit hidden by Tim Cook, Johnny Saruji, just by virtue of being the other Johnny, you know, was was hidden at Apple. He joined there several years ago. My understanding is that he's been reporting to Tim Cook for a while. So senior vice president is more of a recognition of of what he's, who he already is than anything else. But I think it's super important because to me, inarguably the story of this year, maybe the story of the last couple of years is Apple Silicon. Yeah, I mean, um, Silicon isn't something that necessarily gets a, a big name in the in the news because it's not necessarily as sexy as people might uh, think like, oh, s-. you know, you think speed, you're like, yeah, fast, fast phones, but you don't necessarily think of the underlying processes and the ARM chips that power all of that speed and make your camera so fast and make your apps download so fast. Um, and Johnny, you know, I didn't, I actually hadn't heard of Johnny's name until I think last year. Um, because he was so under the radar because he was very much like, this is my team. I'm talking, you know, I'm, I'm working on my good fight and, uh, and then it'll just go into, to phones and tablets. Uh, but the stuff, I mean, the stuff that they have pulled off in the last couple of years is nothing short of remarkable. The fact that crazy, crazy things you would not expect to have arm chips in them, have arm chips in them. <laughs> Uh, and and the fact that they've been able to essentially best some of the best chip makers in the world uh, in such a short period of time and do it on mobile, which is, you know, not it's not an easy thing to work uh, extremely small bits of silicon into, into something super powerful. We saw, you know, we saw IBM struggle for years for the PowerPC architecture. Um, Intel struggled with Broadwell and Skylake uh, in its in its laptops. So for for them to really just hit a home run out of the park with ARM is is huge important. And I mean, I think that this title very, very rightfully bestows some honor on this guy. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's, it's so interesting to see because Apple with the A4, they started doing uh, custom silicon. And if you'd said to me before that, that Apple was going to become arguably the best uh, chip design company in the world, I, I would never have believed it. You know, a- Apple just doesn't do that. It's sort of like saying Intel is going to be the most popular phone company in the world. You, you don't see them operating in those venues, but they have. They have done stuff that because of the way that Apple operates and they don't have to sell their chips to other manufacturers and they don't have to support, you know, multiple platforms on it. They can custom build things exactly for the hardware they want. Bob Mansfield sort of retired. He's, he's still at Apple. He's still, you will still see him there. Uh, but there was this question of who was going to fill that void. And Dan Riccio obviously did it on the um, the actual hardware engineering side. But inarguably, uh, Johnny Saruji has done this on the platform technologies, everything from the chipsets and the boards on up. And it's it's so important to Apple and so uh, it's so hidden to people. But they're, they're doing like the Apple A9 and the Apple A9X, they're flabbergasting chipsets. The power, like you went iPad Pro, you're using that now as your main mobile. I know. It's a, the fact that my iPad Pro is faster at editing video in some respects than my new, my brand new Retina iMac is kind of crazy. Yeah. So uh, yeah, like you said, that is an incredible team top to bottom. And they, I think we're also just seeing the beginning of them. Like they've been very carefully, very quietly building up since PA Semi, since Centricity. And I think most people still don't know uh, the quality of the talent. There are just not that many triple A, like like first rate chip designers in the world. And Apple has a startling amount uh, of them. And I think that's why like in the beginning, I was saying, how can Apple do this? Why, you know, Samsung fabs their own chips, Intel fabs their own chips. How come they're not the ones doing this? And Intel still has a way better process and Apple doesn't have a fab at all. And all these things are absolutely true. But sheer design wise, I think Apple is really well positioned going forward on this. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they've, again, 
They've been snapping up the right talent, which is incredibly key. They have a really good product roadmap going forward. And the fact that they've had to develop silicon on all sizes, I think really puts them in a in a really good place going forward for mobile. I know that, you know, Intel struggled a little bit um, in this in this arena because they've had to play catch up in some respects, especially because, you know, I I I, I don't want to assume this because I don't have the, the numbers to back it up, but I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, Apple putting it in order for your chipsets probably forces you to innovate in a certain regard because Apple's like, this is what I want. This is how I want to build this. This is how I, you know, this is, this needs to fit into here. Yeah. Um, and without that, I imagine like without millions of orders of, of cell phones, you know, uh, Intel's what Intel is Intel working on um, Intel's powering the, the surface. I don't know. Is it, is it powering? Um, they have a phone project. I don't know how successful it's been. Yeah. I mean, they just, they haven't had the chance to really experiment at scale with, uh, with ARM based processors um, the way that I think that Apple, well, I think they still want X86. Like, I, I, they do. Maybe, but, yeah. but I still think they want X86 everywhere. And that's yeah. sort of like wanting windows everywhere. I think going forward. Yeah. It just doesn't, it's, it doesn't make sense in every in every circumstance it really doesn't yeah so it's going to be and as far as i know apple did not announce everything that they've been reorging in this press release and no spoilers because you know these, these are people's lives and jobs and careers and it's not our our, our job to to say anything that apple's not saying there but uh, i'm super excited because apple's got a lot of stuff um apple's got a, a lot of things they're working on even if you take stuff like project titan uh, completely off the grid for now there's a lot of stuff that's happening at apple and your biggest strength is always your biggest weakness and that for apple is culture the culture that makes them a series of small teams inside a large company mm -hmm. when you start to scale and we saw that a bit with products not shipping on time this year and, and other things that it's hard. It is so hard to scale, even when you're already Apple size. And I'm hoping that what this does is is keep the functional in their functional organizations. And the stuff that Tim Cook started when he when he wanted enhanced you know communications and and cooperation by putting everything under Craig Federighi, by putting everything under Angela Aaron's. I think doing this it only increases it, even if it's just we know the guy or you know we know the person at this point. Yeah, I'm I'm really crossing my fingers and hoping that that's true. All right, so congratulations to everybody on their on their awesome new titles. Uh, we look forward to Woo. using all your stuff in the new year. And I'm going to take a quick break and tell you about something else that's pretty cool, and that is Canary. Today's iMore show is brought to you by Canary, a complete home security system in a single device. Since launching earlier this year, people across the world have been using Canary to stop burglar burglaries and other serious incidents. They have cameras on them, 1080p cameras that are complete with wide-angle lenses, motion detection, night vision. If you haven't, if you're not familiar with Canary, you can see them in Apple stores. Uh, they're like these little boxes. I keep thinking Cylon. They don't look anything like a Cylon, but I just keep thinking like they're a little robot Cylon or something that you that you stick in your house. And it's almost like security in the box and it does have a camera on it, but it's also got algorithms that send you intelligent notification when something out of the ordinary is happening. It's got a 90 decibel surround, sorry, a 90 decibel siren that's loud enough to scare off intruders. It also pulls in local police and fire department numbers so they're easy for you to call. It automatically arms and disarms when you leave the home. So you don't have to worry about, uh, did I put in the code that I take out the code. I'm panicking. It's beeping. Where's my code? Uh, it is just such a better way of handling all this. And you can link up to four Canary devices together. So you can have little silence like in every room if that's what you really want. It monitors your home temperature, the humidity, the air quality. So it can protect you not just against you know theft or, or break-ins, but but potentially hazardous environments as well. It's got night vision. So if you, if you're whether you're home or you're away and you hear something, you can actually look and see what it is. It shows you a pitch black room as if it looked like daytime, looks like something out of a movie. There's a privacy mode. So if you're worried about having this kind of monitoring system in your house, if you want to, you know, do your, 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 uh, karaoke night not be judged for the quality of your audio you can just put it in privacy mode and the camera and the mic are completely turned off you don't have to worry about them at all uh, when it's on and it sees motion it'll start recording it it'll detect the motion so it doesn't stream an empty room but it'll stream exactly when you need it to so here's what I want you to do. Start protecting your home with Canary today. For a limited time, Canary is just $149. Go to meetcanary.com and use the promo code IMORE to get free overnight shipping. That's meetcanary.com. Protocol, say protocol. Promo code IMORE. Smart home security for everyone. Canary. Thank you, Canary. Thanks, that stuff Canary. is so cool. It's like having a security droid in your house. Right? I know. I know. I We need one. Like ichuta, ichu And then it comes out. <laughs> ichuta. <laughs> All right. So uh, Apple News aside, we were doing our massive year end review and we got all the way to WWDC. So now, Ren, it, it is time to talk about all the OSs. 
all the OSs, all of them. <laughs> so I, I was trying to think which one was the most important. And like, obviously iOS is the most popular and it's the foundation for watch OS and now for TV OS too. Um, and, but the, the news this year for everything was sort of, you know, people keep saying a snow leopard year and snow leopard still had massive changes. Like it had, you know, exchange and it had uh, open CL and all these things that went under the hood. But I think the messaging this year was similar, sort of like we've heard you and we're working on making things better. Mm -hmm. No question. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's interesting for me to like pick a, pick a, uh, an OS, right? Because I think at the end of the day, iOS nine wins for me. But it was, you know, there's some really, really good stuff that came down in the, the pipeline of the latest version of OS 10. I really like the fact, the way that they're combining iOS and OS 10 features without necessarily making them the same platform. I think split screen apps and the new mission control are amazing. Um, as a frequent, I used to use mission control nonstop when I was on my 11 inch air and uh, the new version of OS 10 just makes it so easy. Uh, but Ultimately, I think the iOS 9 iPad multitasking features are the thing and the and low battery mode are the things that like win my best feature of 2015. Watch so, OS 2 is nice, but mm. so the thing for me is that um iOS 7 was this radical redesign and iOS 8 was this functional revolution. And we went from having sort of like this really, and it was a personality change too, because Scott Forstall left and Craig Federici took over, uh, Johnny Ive took over design. And it really was a transformation period for Apple. And they had they tore a lot of stuff down. And we've, we know from past history that Apple is relentlessly fearless about embracing what's new. So we went from this heavily uh, textured um, environment uh, to, you know, suddenly we have multiple sizes of things and we have a very clean look and we have extensibility, which to me is still one of the biggest advances in the history of, of the platform. And all of that was super painful, but a lot of what we had, like we wouldn't have watch, app watch apps at all now, for example, if we hadn't gone through all that. No, we wouldn't. Um, it I feel like the early versions of OSs are a lot of pulling teeth, right? It's a lot of throwing features out there, seeing if they stick, seeing how they work and then fine tuning them. Um, I know Apple is, you know, usually wants to release an app and a uh, feature when it's complete. Uh, but even when it's, you know, even copy and paste, you know, they, they put that out with, uh, with iOS two, uh, I guess iPhone OS two, uh, and it's more or less been the same that it is, but they've, they've done little tweaks to text selection since then. I think that's the, that's the mentality of OS updates that I, that I like to see. Is They're iterative. There. Yeah, exactly. I iterative is the, iterative is the watch word. <laughs> Yeah. And it's really, so what they chose to focus on, uh, they ended up leveraging a lot of the technologies in super, super interesting ways. Like, so we had the stuff that happened in iOS 8, including continuity and extensibility, but it turns out that they use the stuff for continuity to do things like in-app search. So uh, I remember I launched Overcast and I just said, remind me of this. And immediately Siri put up a little reminder because Marco had built in continuity. It, it had the activity uh, tracking stuff built into it already. So it, I, it just saved a reminder for me about what podcast and what place I was in. And that was tremendously, like tremendously good functionality. And then you could record your video game, but because of extensibility, the app had no idea, like it had no ability to record your messages or anything else private that might happen mm -hmm. while you were, and we started seeing the benefits of the, of Apple's investments in these technologies. Yeah. I, I think that iOS nine and uh, the latest version of OS 10 both compound on extensibility to a certain extent, not as much as I had wished. I'm still kind of waiting for, uh, for music music to develop yeah. handoff technology. I'm like there was an app called seamless that was available five years ago that could do this. Come on guys. Uh, but they have made ex incredible strides forward in terms of they have, you know, point a here, we're going to lay the groundwork. And now in iOS nine and OS 10, we're going to put extra features on there that take advantage of that groundwork. Replay kit is one really, really great example. Uh, they did, I think some under the hood work with airdrop, this, uh, this iteration that wasn't necessarily out, but it's much more reliable now, which is really awesome. Um, low power mode is phenomenal. It's not necessarily an extensibility space thing, but that's something I keep coming back to where low power mode, um, I think takes a, takes a problem that Apple realized its consumers were having its users were having just saying oh hey my phone is dying and is getting out of battery and it turns out that there are a couple of very specific things to blame for that battery suckage so let's see if we can address this on a system level so that the user doesn't lose their battery 
I only wish that it would prompt me sooner because I would totally run my phone in low batter mode, low, ba- low power mode all the time. I don't need push email really. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I mean, there's a lot of really, really good stuff in there. And if people aren't familiar with the way that uh, it works, uh, it's sort of like a continuum. It's not like this is what's going to be iOS line. It's like these are the features that we're working on. And at a certain point, uh, Federici sits down and goes through all of them. And it's really cool at Apple because marketing does push down things. Say we need, you know, messaging is competitive. We need this and this and this to be competitive in messaging. Uh, but engineers can also propose stuff and say, we think this would be a great feature. And that gets put in the pile. And when they do those discussions, that can make it in as well. But at a certain point, they figure out what they can deliver by the deadline. Um, like if you notice, uh, iPhones always ship and iOS always ships. You know, some companies that's not true and some products that's not true, but mm-hmm. the iPhone and iOS always ship. Uh, and that's because they make these hard choices. So there, there's stuff that shipped in iOS 9 that was being worked on for iOS 7. It just wasn't ready on time. So I think that's absolutely true that they 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 work on these things like Siri is always being evolved on the, on the server side, but it there are certain things that need to go in the OS and then people complain, oh, I have these apps I can't erase, but it's it's tied into that app too. So like you have, that app has to be updated to support these things. So it's this really complex little web um, and it, it does cause pain. But I think we were talking about this the other day. Um, some people are like, ah, Android phones have like three gigabytes of RAM or four gigabytes of RAM and eight processors. And yeah, but it's an interpreted language and it has garbage collection and it has to run software that's available for multiple platforms and uses chipsets that have to carry the, 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 the overhead of maybe supporting OpenGL and uh, DirectX and all. It has all this extra stuff to carry. And because Apple is using native code and native frameworks and their features are coded specifically for that platform, uh, it gives them a tremendous advantage, but the the problem is that level of integration. Like everything, every every great point also has its disadvantages. That level of integration means that when there are problems, like our our good friend, uh, um, the one that MDNF responder replaced, uh, Discovery D, when sort of something like Discovery D happens, which we should talk about, uh, you you get pain everywhere. Oh yeah, it's the one downside to Apple trying to integrate all of its things because sometimes the integration comes off poorly. And in fact, funny funny story about Discovery D. Uh, despite the fact that OS X has been updated, uh, some of my uh, some of my Airport Expresses still have uh, I think uh, anger pains about uh, Discovery D because I've broken a uh, time capsule in an Airport Express I think permanently as a result of that. Anytime they connect to the network, they just kill the entire network. <laughs> which is problems, but mostly, usually Apple does well with this. Yeah, so Discovery D uh, is sort of emblematic to me. So uh, for years, um, there was an idea within the company to do this modern networking uh, stack called this, and it ended up being called Discovery D. And people said no, because they knew how painful it was going to be. And they said no for years. And then eventually continuity and extensibility because of the way it worked, they're like, oh, we might as well try this now. And it managed to get in there. And it just it just ended up causing problems. And people tried to fix it and tried to fix it and tried to fix it. And what I liked is that Apple at some point decided that it was not worth it. They could not fix it. And they were willing to roll it back. And a company, Apple size, can sometimes be too proud to do that. And that's a real problem. But they fixed a ton of bugs and they fixed a ton yeah. of problems. And they had to, yeah, they had to backport the continuity code and, and some other things into NDNS responder, but they did it. They sort of um, ate bitter. I, I, that's a Chinese term. I don't know if it translate well, but they they suffered to, through doing that. Like it, it is a loss of face for that team. And it is, you know, it, it's sort of not an aptly thing to do, but I, I like that because it makes me believe that they're willing to admit when things went wrong and, and fix them no matter what the cost. Yeah. And I'm, I'll be honest. I hope that 2016 is a lot of, uh, a lot of that a lot of re-examining some of the things that maybe don't work so well. We talked a little bit um, in our last end of year show about the watch and about how certain things on the watch work really well, but certain things they may need may need to re-examine. I kind of feel the same way about certain aspects of software too. Um, I, I went on a big rant on uh, Jason Snell's Clockwise. Uh, I heard that. That was yeah. good. <laughs> or I was, uh, the, for instance, iOS 9 does a lot to uh, forward the iPad as a first-class citizen um, and as a, as a proper mobile citizen. But there are certain things like audio that just don't work. Uh, and I would really love to see polished in the future. Uh, I mean, I've been, I've been yelling about styluses for for four and a half years five years so uh, now that my stylus crusade is uh mostly finished i think it's time that i move on to a new ipad related passion and and that's going to be core audio (laughs) 
I'm so sorry, designers and engineers in advance, but core audio needs to must must be fixed for iOS. Yeah, no, because now see that's the thing is the cost of making a tablet that people will use as their primary um, mobile computer is that you are going to have people using it as their primary mobile yep. computer, <laughs> and any pain they feel will be expressed to you directly. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yeah. So the other interesting thing, so we had the Siri and the search, we had the, the split, um, the multitasking for iPad and Apple, it, I, I get a lot of crap when I say this, but iOS has always had really good multitasking because it's based on OS 10. It, it's a full multitasking stack for various reasons, including performance and security. Apple just completely crippled what it could do for years. But if you recall that first Steve Jobs uh, demo in the, for the iPhone, he was uh, he was listening to music. A phone call came in. He answered the phone call. He went and looked up something on Safari, looked up something in mail, went back to the phone call, hung up, and the music came back in. And if you had a trio back then, you, your jaw dropped because that was just not possible. <laughs> You're, it would crash and reboot several times during that. Like, um, how is this even working? How is this magic? Yeah, and then the App Store came across, and they just had they allowed. They, it wasn't that they couldn't. This they allowed zero multitasking for that, and then slowly over the years they allowed very specific APIs and then background tasks. And now they're doing uh, side by side apps, so you can do the picture in picture, you can do the slide over, you can do the split view, and have two or three apps on the screen at the same time. But it, it's still in a highly constrained way. It is not the tile drag and drop sort of interface of OS ten. Yeah. Uh, and and I, there are some things that I think are actually better in that regard. I wouldn't want window-based uh, viewing the way that we have in OS X. I much prefer single apps and split-screen apps. I would like to be able to pull maybe a few more things out. Um, I, you know what, it, what I would really love, and this is kind of a long shot, but uh, the old dashboard interface had a way that you could make basically a web clip of something yep. on Safari where you'd clip some of it and then you could paste it in dashboard. It would be really cool to do that uh, for for other apps, uh, kind of like picture in picture for videos. I but think I picture in picture for apps would be great. Like let me run pcalc in the picture in picture window. Exactly. Like just have a res one resizable floating floating window. And I know people are like, well, that gets us too close to OS 10, and you're just you're just hacking it at that point. And it, you know what? It may not work. I'm sure someone at Apple is already playing with it and testing it. And um, you know. It, it, I, I would be cool to have. Uh, but the, the main thing I do want is drag and drop between split view. I think that that could be incredibly useful, um, especially when you come like photos and, and uh, Dropbox, things like that. Uh, and yeah, it's uh, there's like a, a lot of little things, especially I've noticed as I've been using my Pro as my primary computer, uploading uh, images from Safari is another thing where you you can do it now. You can upload files, which is great. And that's how I've been uploading all of our images to the CMS. But renaming files requires using workflow. Um, and getting them out of iCloud Drive means basically tapping the tap iCloud Drive, tap the folder that the photos are in, tap the photo. Okay, go to the next photo, tap iCloud Drive, tap the photo folder the photos in, tap the photo. And there, you know, there are things that OS X has done right for a long time, like remembering what folder you were last in when you tap the highlight picker. And that might be something where Sandbox runs into trouble there, um, but it's still something that I would like to see. Little, little productivity improvements or being able to select multiple files at once to upload um, if the yeah. picker supports multiple upload files. Yeah, there's still, we talked about this a couple of shows ago about multitasking in general. Like the, you still can't change the primary and secondary window in the same way. They have completely different ways of changing them. On OS 10, the split view, you basically can't alter it. You you create it and then destroy it, but you can't alternate what apps are in there. There's no switching mechanism at all. So mm -hmm. I like that we have it, but it, and I understand like none of, when I when I say like, you know, there's certain things you can't do. A lot of stuff is really hard. Like Apple really wants to maintain that security model and they're building out all these remote view controllers. So that apps can't leak you know, malware or something between one and the other, or they can't uh, expose your private data between one app and the other. But And the idea that you could start putting these remote views, like maybe having two Safari windows side by side we talked about, or mm -hmm. being able to dynamically change them or float data, I think all that is is really awesome. But I think you know it takes us, uh, it, they can release what they can one year, and then like we said, they iterate and iterate. Yeah, which is totally fine. I understand that there are only so many developer hours in the world, and I appreciate a stable system over a crazy system. <laughs> One thing we did get uh, finally, and I'm going to use the, the giant ca all caps finally here, is iCloud Drive on iCloud iOS. Drive. Oh my God! It you know what? That is one of the single biggest ways that I actually can function 
on my iPad Pro. It was one of those things where, uh, you know, and Marco said this really well in one of his podcasts when he was talking about the original version of the magazine and his desire not to have a preferences uh, screen. And you have to start doing so many gymnastics to avoid having a preferences screen that it's, it's, it's more complicated than just having it. And I think that was the same thing with Apple is their desire not to have not not to sort of uh, force a file system on people because a file system really isn't human. It's something that people who grew up with computers understand, but nobody should have to deal with a file system. But they were so adamant against it that it created far more complexities. Like a couple of generations ago, if you wanted to create a text file, you'd open an app and create it, but then it would be jailed inside that app. And if you used a different app or deleted that app, and then you wanted to find that, you had no way of finding that file by itself. It was all all of the pain. All of the pain. <laughs> and now you can just go to iCloud Drive and you know maybe you, you have to go through the folders to find it, but you can just search and find it. And it's always been a better idea. And Apple solved it with photos. The first generation of iPhone, they had the photos.app and they had photo picker. And now they have iCloud Drive.app and document picker. And it, it took us nine versions to get here, but I'm so happy we finally got here. Yeah, me too. Um, it's it's again, as you said, it's not necessarily something that the average user is going to to need, uh, but for people who really de- you know require files in their life and also who need to name files, I think that's also really important. Uh, working with our CMS, our content management system for iMore, we need to upload photos, and we may need to find those photos again at a future time and date. And if you just upload them from photos.app, all you get is photo.jpg every time you upload an image, which is really unfortunate for when I'm like, oh, I want to find old Star Wars images I uploaded. Let's see if I can find them. Oh, no, no. Okay, that's a problem. Uh, so in exchange, uh, having iCloud Drive there and having photos that I can properly name when I import them into iCloud Drive, that's really awesome. And then, as I said, combining it with workflow allows me to also resize the photos so that they're proper, the proper size and ratio for web, and that's really cool too. So there's there's a lot of really, I think it's really nice features for people who really do want to use the system for professionals. Yeah, no, I, I I agree completely. And I think the stuff that was in OS 10 El Capitan, uh, and the name itself, El Capitan is a mountain range within Yosemite, which was the name of the previous version, shows that Apple did consider it a refinement. But I think it, it did, it made like Spotlight much more useful and much more flexible. Uh, and it did it brought the split view. And I think it did stuff that that made the Mac experience just better. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So watch OS, Ren. We got watch OS. Uh, we were we were both really, really hoping for custom complications and custom complications we got. This is the number one the number one thing I actually actively use on my Apple Watch is custom complications. Native apps hasn't really we haven't seen a lot of it yet. Um, we haven't seen a lot of native apps. We haven't seen a lot of the other things. Um, but custom complications, oh man, does that make my life easy? Yeah, they did. They did the native apps. So basically, the way native apps work, though, is previously the extension, the interface lived on the Apple Watch. The extension of the app of the iPhone app lived on the iPhone and communicated back and forth. Now the app still lives on the iPhone, but the extension lives with the interface on the Apple Watch. So it's not a full blown app the way it is on the iPhone, but it is native code running on the watch. It's just native code on the watch. It's still not clear that's the best way to do it. And I think, like you said, custom complications, things like Siri, things like glances, might end up being a better a better path forward, or maybe something we haven't thought of yet. I lost my mute key. Uh, yeah, I I think, and I we talked about this a little bit when we talked about the watch uh, earlier, but I do think that these sort of minor interactions are more the way that the watch should go. I don't want to be tapping something. I don't want to be searching through the carousel. I would much rather glance down at my watch like I am right now, and I see the carrot weather uh, glance that says, feels like 53 degrees, high of 53, low of 40, rain for the hour. That's really helpful, and that's something that I would normally launch two apps to find out or, or swoop down or try to look at a glance. Um, I also have a little traffic complication that tells me how long it's going to take to go see The Force Awakens tonight, how long the traffic is. Um, and the one of the really cool... Compl- that's on speeder bike, by the way, right? You're going oh, down yeah. on speeder bike? <laughs> um, hello. The hair, is, the hair is perfect for speeder bikes. Uh, one of the other cool complication features that I've seen is a quick shortcut to launch an app. Yeah. Uh, there aren't very many apps that I use directly on the watch, as I think I said last time, but just press record is one of them. Um, it's a little, I think, a one or two ninety nine app uh, that's available on iOS as well as on the Mac, where all you have to do is tap the complication, which I just did, 
and then it immediately switches to the app and presses re the record button. So I'm talking right now, and as you can see for people who are watching on the uh, on the live stream, it actually records anything that you say into the uh, into the watch microphone, and then is saved using iCloud Drive over to your phone, and then it can be accessed on iCloud Drive from any app which is super, super cool. For me, I really like it because sometimes I'll get ideas uh, for articles or for songs or for pretty much anything while I'm driving. Um, and previous to that, I had to pull out the notes app and try and press dictation. And if dictation didn't get it down right, it was awkward and I was still fiddling with things. And now if I'm driving or if I'm somewhere where it doesn't really make sense for me to be typing or writing, all I have to do is press that one little button and then I can just be like, Hey, uh, how about an, ar an article about how I use my workflow? And specifically, I want to mention this workflow and how it helps me organize my photos. Like, that's really awesome. I it, one, of, one of my favorite complications. One of the things I do most is, is now that we have the Yo Siri functionality is to just say, Yo Siri, take a note, and then just blab a bunch of stuff and hope that it comes out in recognizable form. But if that moved to the watch, I'd be super happy too. I just, mm -hmm. I still want notes on my watch. Just I really oh. want notes on the watch. I really, really, really want notes on the watch. Please, okay. Kevin, please, yeah. Kevin. <laughs> I also settle for a one writer extension on the watch. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. All right, we're going to take one more quick break. Then we're going to come back and talk Swift and Apple Music. Uh, stay tuned. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash imore. lynda.com is, is for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to master office, learn negotiation tactics, build a website, boost your Photoshop skills, learn how to go to Tossy Station for your power regulator, any of those things, with the exception of maybe Tossy Station. You got to go to lynda.com and feed your curious mind. There's a bunch of great courses available. And the minute something new comes out, uh, lynda.com, if they don't have it on launch day, they have it soon thereafter. Swift just went open source. We're going to talk about that soon. But I'm willing to bet that if not now, then very soon you'll be able to go and learn everything you need to know about getting started with it right on lynda.com. Same is true for all these wonderful apps, things like, you know, how to get better at using Excel. I still don't know what a pivot table is. Uh, I just bought a new camera and I, I'm going to have to learn more about photography because I'm still way too point and shooty and not enough manually. So I've been working my way through some of the photography stuff there. Going paperless start to finish. iPad and iPhone security fundamentals. It's the new year. You really want to bone up on your security. Uh, with lynda.com, you can watch and learn from top experts, people who are passionate about teaching. You can stream thousands of videos on demand. You can learn at your own schedule. One of the things I like most is I don't sometimes have time to watch an entire course, so I can just look quickly for a question and then find the answer, do it, and then get on with the, with the job at hand. And then later, I'll go back and watch more of it. But it really, it just, it just solves problems almost immediately. You can browse each video course transcript and follow along. You can search for answers, skip to that point, take notes, refer back to them later, download tutorials, watch them on the go, on the go. Sorry, include access on your, and you can access it on your iOS device, on your iPhone, your iPad, even your Android device. Create and save playlists. The list goes on and on. So here's what I want you to do. Your lynda.com membership will give you all unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an industry expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, I want you to go to lynda.com slash IMOR and sign up for your free, absolutely free 10-day trial. That's L-Y-N-D-A.com slash IMOR, I-M-O-R-E. Thanks, Linda. Uh, so let's do music first so we can end on a happy note. How's that? Apple, let's do that <laughs> so apple it was it was one of the weirdest things at wwc because after all the software announcements eddie q came up on stage and he announced apple music which included a new music app a new streaming music service beats one uh radio uh, a connect sort of a social network uh, and you know there was uh drake up on stage with him jimmy iovine was uh, up on stage most people were not very happy with that segment some of our our more musically inclined friends kind of dug it depending on what their musical tastes were but it, it was not your usual wwdc segment it was not um and as someone sitting in the audience for that wwdc especially after a very tight very quick moving dub dub that had a lot of different uh items in it. Uh, the music section was a little a little strange. It wasn't bad, I won't say, but it, de it definitely was a little more meandering than the rest of the presentation, which I think when everybody stepped back, I think that was a big, uh, a big sort of red flag. Not a red flag, but like a, 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 a it, it stuck in their minds the way that I don't think it would have, it would have been quite so um, 
out of the ordinary if it had been a little bit tighter. We had sort of, we had uh, Jimmy Iovine kind of wandering uh, the stage. You had actually a really, what I thought was a really good speech by Drake, but some people were like, oh, that was a little, little too, too long, a little too well, again, I mean, meandering. Some people are really, like, so some people really love the classic Apple. Like they love the Steve Jobs keynote. And a lot of people at Apple can do that. Like they can get up there and they can do the Phil Schiller. Like Phil Schiller can absolutely nail that. Craig Vederiki is more jokey than previous, mm -hmm. but people like, some people really like that. Other people really want that, like, stick to the script. And Drake and Jimmy really were not stick to the script people. No, no. They really wanted to just, I mean, it's musicians, right? Musicians spend their entire life writing their their thoughts down in rhymes and, and clever lyrics. They're not, they don't tend to, you know, they want to, they want to do their own thing. Yeah, absolutely. So, but Apple Music, the thing that to me, two things stuck out to me. One was the ambition of it. It wasn't just that Apple was adding streaming music, it's that they were redoing the app, adding streaming music, adding radio, adding a social network. And uh, Jimmy Iovine, uh, he stated it was, it was supposed to be one single thought about music, like everything about music all in one place. Uh, and that is incredibly hard to nail. But the, and you've mentioned this many times before, they did not ship it as a beta. No, they did not. And I'm really frustrated that they did that, honestly, because I think that there's a lot of potential there, right? There's a lot of, there's still a lot of potential in Apple Music. And to ship it as, to ship it as, oh yeah, this is fully finished when it clearly wasn't, even, you know, even the folks at Beats One are like, we're experimenting. We have no idea where this is going. Um, but that's kind of the fun of it. Let's be part of the experiment. And I thought Photo Library was a beta. Siri was a beta. There was tons of betas. Exactly. Since Apple has had the history of betas for its cloud services, I'm like, please guys. Uh, and I think that bit them that bit them in a in a place uh, that it probably shouldn't have. You know, there are a lot of people who are very frustrated with Apple Music. Jim Darmple, who could have been one of Apple Music's biggest supporters, being a music guy, um, they, uh, you know, the, he his library got inadvertently ruined. And while it got fixed, um, it still did not put a good taste in his mouth. Did not put a good taste in a lot of people's mouths. Uh, a lot of a lot of stuff just got jumbled. I've been answering questions about. I, about iCloud Music Library and about music um, and Apple Music for months now. So I'm just kind of- And that of was, it was a bit of a feat, like a theme, like to both be fair and unfair to Jim, like his problems, a lot of it stemmed from him having a massive music collection, but people who had massive photo connections had collections had a lot of pain with uh, iCloud Photo Library and people who had massive video collections had a lot of pain with the new Apple TV. It, yeah. These products are mostly designed for sort of people coming, I don't know if they're designed that way, but they, they were most useful for people like me who don't have any collections and just want to say, hey, Siri, do this, do that, do this. Yeah. Uh, and then they work great. But if, if you came to any of these new services this year with a massive pre-installed base of material, you had pain. Yeah, it was it was really frustrating. So um, the, the, the upside, though, to all this is that Craig Federighi came out and he announced not only Swift 2.0, but he announced Swift going open source. And if you knew Chris Latner, who was the person in charge of all this at Apple and his background with LLVM and Clang and all these open source projects, you kind of had to think that this is the direction they wanted it to go. But it's still, you know, a major step for Apple. Yes, WebKit is open source, absolutely. But Swift is is their next big programming language. And I think it makes a ton of sense, but it's also always a little surprising when a company like Apple does something this big. Yeah, I mean, I just, uh, we've talked about this before on how, you know, when they said open source, we're like, okay, Apple, yeah, <laughs> open source. Uh, but no, they, they're 100% uh, committed to this. There's a GitHub, they're, they're literally committed. Um, they are letting people commit to their projects, which is pretty... Committed to committing. Yeah, commit. They're committed to committing. Uh, no, this is this is, in my opinion, as a non. I'm not a programmer, uh, other than a front end. You know, my, PHP is my language, not C. Uh, but it's it seems to me that this is a really really exciting development uh, for development for developers. I guess I'm going all in on the wordplay tonight. I I, I really want to try my hand at a Swift project because I think it's something that I'd actually enjoy learning. I've played a little, I've played a little bit with playgrounds. <laughs> uh, <laughs> playground and, is where I spent most of my yeah, day. <laughs> on the playground. Um, I, I really, it makes me really excited and happy that Apple is doing this. 
Yeah, I, I love the optimism of it. Like they really, uh, and if you haven't already, please go listen to the latest episode of John Gruber's a talk show where he's, he has a, a really good 30 minute episode um, interview with uh, Craig Federici, Senior Vice President of Software Engineering. And then about a two hour episode with John Syracuse dissecting the 30 minute <laughs> interview, which is also great um, because you know I, I don't really understand Swift very well. So hearing them talk about it, it's incredibly educational for me. But there is this huge optimism. They want this to be the language for the next 20 years, but not just for Apple. They want, when I, and we talked about this before, when I was a kid, I had like logo in school and basic, and then they were approachable languages. And now like my little God kids are, are doing bits box and out of code with like, it was essentially uh, move around JavaScript stuff, which is cool, but it, it's not really approachable. Mm -hmm. And something like Swift could absolutely be a revel, not just a revolution, but a revelation for kids in classrooms. <laughs> Have you been listening to the Hamilton soundtrack? Uh, yeah, I was told to. Uh, yes, under orders because it's delightful. Uh, yeah, I I think this could be huge for classrooms, and it it really makes me I, I said it makes me excited that Apple is going down this direction, and that they're providing so many materials and documentation for for people in education, for professors, for students. Uh, the closer, the more quickly that this language gets adopt in the adopted in the classrooms and by people who are curious about it, the more apps are gonna get written in Swift, the more Swift is gonna get adopted across the board. Uh, we do, have we talked at all a little bit about um, its potential in sort of taking over data servers too. And yeah. that's, that's something where I will be curious to see how that shakes out, uh, especially considering, you know, uh, Apple's, uh, on and off cloud services problem. I wonder if, uh, if having their data centers rewritten in Swift might help them at all. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. Not a programmer here, so I'm probably just talking out of my <laughs> out of my other. But people are excited about it, and it's yeah. and that's interesting. When when people who are into code are sort of excited about this kind of stuff, I think it's 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 super important. Absolutely. So it seems to me like Steve Jobs famously said that Apple was like Babe Ruth. They, you know, they swung and they just kept hitting it every time. And I think arguably, you know, over the last couple of years, because of their size and because of how many balls they're trying to hit at the same time, they have fouled it off a couple of times. They have even struck out a couple of times. Mm -hmm. But things, but but they're still when they do connect, they're still connecting really, really solid and knocking it out the park. And that's sort of the story of this year. And we still haven't even gotten to the fall. Uh, we'll have to do next show on fall. Oh my god! Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so much stuff. But uh, it, it's it's really interesting to me just watching a company like Apple, the world's biggest company in terms in, uh, across a wide variety of metrics, sort of struggle to be the world's biggest company and to see like, how do you become even bigger, biggest company? Yeah. Who? So we have now officially gotten through two thirds of, two -thirds the, year of the year, year. the very big year. And uh, so next time, we get to talk about this. Yeah, we got to talk about two iPhones, two iPads, some new iMacs, uh, a bunch of new accessories. Battery cases. Yeah. Docs. Uh, Apple, please don't release anything. I've been using it. I've been using it for a couple of days, so I'll be sharing more and more thoughts. I've been using it all week. I have some interesting, I have some. I'm going to, we're going to hashtag love the hump and see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> or own the hump. We'll figure it out. Yeah, own the bat. Own the band aid. Uh, so, uh, Serenity, if people are interested in following you in the meantime, before we continue on next week, w where can they go? They can follow me at Saturn S E T T E R N, which is currently going under the name R two D T N A T, which is my roller derby name in honor of Star Wars: The Force Awakens, which opens today. Ah! Uh, they can also find me on Instagram and on imore.com and on the incomparable.com slash radio, where we're going to do some radio theater magic. Awesome. You can find me at Renee Richie. You can find all of us at iMore. You can find this show at youtube.com slash iMore video or on iTunes. I, uh, I, so we, we talked about this before, but Star Wars was the first movie I ever saw at, in the movie theater. And it was the biggest impression that a movie's ever made on me because it was the first. And I don't, I don't, my affection for Star Wars is not literal. It's not based exactly on the movie I saw, but what that movie means to me. Mm -hmm. So I have to be incredibly careful not to say, like, not to measure this by the same thing because that that trilogy the trilogy exists in me way differently than it exists in the real world yeah um i my goal going into this i've tried not to get my expectations up too much i want a movie that i enjoy that i have fun with that's my that's my only goal there i'm like if i can have fun with this movie and if i can enjoy it then i will be a happy camper um it doesn't need to it doesn't need to be better than star wars for me it just needs to you know capture some of the joy it needs to not be the prequels and I'll be yeah. I'll be okay. Really, that's not a hard hard bar to to jump over. Not worse than the prequels. 
there are things that I deeply love in this world. And when I like when I I cannot watch the sequels, like I literally I, I can watch movies hundreds of times in a row. I can just watch them over and over again because I, I care about the story. Yeah. But once I've seen the story, I just love the way that they're rendered, like what the actors are doing and, and the story there. I'd love story even more than gadgets. I love story. I cannot watch Men of Steel and I cannot watch the prequels. Oh, uh, yeah. they, they are the opposite of story to me. They're just so badly done. The choices are so terrible that I can't watch them without getting like without getting up and leaving. Uh, so that's my goal for this: is I just want a good Star Wars movie. And like we talked, the, the the Rebel show is great. The Clone Wars was great. People can make great Star Wars. I just want to see great Star Wars in the movie theater again. Yes, agreed, agreed. All right. So next, ne- no spoilers, but next week you'll see whether Ren and I survive this. Yes, exactly. No spoilers. And in fact, I have a guide on iMore right now about keeping yourself spoiler free and also things that you can do to enjoy, like hype yourself up before you go see the film. I highly recommend it. So far, my filters have worked very well into I have not seen any, any articles and I'd like to keep it that way. So please be nice. Do not spoil me. I, otherwise, I will come send Banthas after you and send people. I almost had to report Panduino for abuse until he backed off. It was very yeah, close. Sir. Now yeah, I don't I open just, Twitter. I just don't open Twitter. I leave it on the at section and I don't go to the, the tw- timeline. Be, I've heard this from other people too. I think this is the only uh, the only time I've ever heard people actually being like, I'm staying off social media because social media is seriously spoiling me and I don't want to do it. I'm like, man, thank God I have nice friends. <laughs> well, I mean, I'd have to reach through the screen and just end people like Dark yeah, Forest exactly. Lightning. And I now you die. Hold on. Not- you got you to gotta put up your. All right. There we go. Help me, Twitterati. Do not spoil me. <laughs> All right, Ren. So I will. We will talk. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We will Thanks, be back. Uh, we'll be back next week. Adios. Bye. Bye. Bye.